good evening the discussion of this pips here the part 2 uh, which was done few days back was not uh, recorded due to a technical problem and uh, i thought of re-recording it and then uh, uh, posting it to the youtube for your youtube device again so uh, let us move on from where we stopped in part 1 uh, we are discussing about dyspepsia upper gastrointestinal problems and then upper gastrointestinal masses upper gastrointestinal discomfort this whole thing in a long case or a question will come as a presenting complaint so we have discussed in the first part the investigations to be done how the history should be taken what is what are the examination findings and uh, now we have come to the specific area of discussing the differential diagnosis out of which we have done part of it in the part 1 that is the peptic calcer disease and uh, the second differential diagnosis uh, we have started that is gastric cancer and we have done an mcq and this uh, mcq was done last time just to uh, join the two lectures together uh, we'll discuss it once more regarding risk factors of gastric cancer uh, increased risk with diet low in salt true or false answers and uh, the answer will be false because it's generally the high salt diets and uh, in addition to that smoked food which contain nitrate nitrites uh, are associated with upper gastrointestinal cancers fruits and vegetables intake is protective is true uh, because it has been shown high fiber and fruits and vegetable uh, consumption is protective in gastric cancer family history of stomach cancer is again it's true because there are familial genetic predisposition uh, of stomach cancer and infection with helicobacter pylori again is associated associated with gastric cancer uh, but uh, association uh, is a risk factor but association is not direct which we will find in uh, the subsequent uh, discussion generally the helicobacter pylori is associated with atrophic gastritis and indirectly as atrophic gastritis is associated with it's a predisposing factor for gastric cancer so chronic iron deficiency anemia again uh, is false because uh, it is vitamin b12 deficiency or pernicious anemia which is connected with gastric cancer which is a predisposing factor and also in addition i have mentioned here benign gastric polyps also be predisposed to gastric cancer uh, let us move on to a new mcq coming up in this part 2 h pylori is a direct causative factor uh, extension to the previous mcq with the same knowledge you can answer this uh, h pylori is a direct causative factor is uh, actually false because it acts through the atrophic gastritis as i have mentioned a minute ago and uh, hyperplastic polyps again uh, is a known causative factor of gastric cancer and about the polyps fundic polyps are not precancerous and that is false again because in the first uh, answer i have hinted you that uh, any kind of fundic or uh, any kind of polyp gastric polyp can be precancerous and especially if it is over 1 cm uh, it need to be removed and uh, it's also associated with ingestion of long term proton pump inhibitors 
and uh, this is associated with H pi lower I right? polyps. Double contrast barium meal is useful in staging. Double contrast barium meal. Actually speaking, barium meal alone is a luminal investigation. That means it shows the lumen and it will show space occupying lesions and uh, ulcers malignant ulcer crater but when it comes to staging you have to know the extra luminal extension so when it comes to that barium meal is of no use so the answer is false it is only diagnostic but it is not for staging An endoscopic ultrasound is more reliable in t-staging in tna Actually, for T staging, there are only two uh, actually two important investigations. One is the CT contrast in the CT. Other one is endoscopic ultrasound. And uh, you must have seen it's been done, or oh, I'm sure you have heard about it. And when it comes to staging, endoscopic ultrasound is much more reliable. Uh, when it not only for T staging but also for the nodal staging. Staging laparoscopy is a must for all radiologically node positive cases. Staging laparoscopy. Staging laparoscopy has become a standard investigation in most of the upper GI uh, cancers because, as you know, peritoneal deposits, sometimes omental deposits, are not seen in any other investigation. And the presence of peritoneal or mental deposits make a big difference, huge difference to the management because then that will, the cancer will be categorized as advanced cancer and radical surgery will not be the proper treatment. So staging laparoscopy is the most reliable method of uh, diagnosing peritoneal deposits. So it's true. And I have uh, attached a little slide here in case you are answering uh, SEQ, where what are the investigation for gastric cancer? Di you, you can always categorize it into diagnostic investigations, general investigations, which will check whether the patient is suitable to undergo anesthesia, and then the staging investigations. So, as we were discussing in the MCQ, double contrast barium meal is a Diagnostic investigation as a preliminary diagnos diagnosis and also the endoscopy, endoscopy biopsy and brush cytology, they are all diagnostic. But when it comes to treatment or staging, you need this endoscopic ultrasound, CT and the laparoscopy, staging laparoscopy. And laparoscopic staging, uh, when you have time, you can go through this slide and then uh, find the importance of it. This is again the useful for the long case discussion. The long case will be 65 year old man pursuing with episodic epigastric pain or dyspepsia and uh, endoscopy shows that there is a cancerous growth which is proved by the histology. So, the second examiner, the last part, the time permits, they will go into details of, not details actually, actually the outline of management because you have been given the diagnosis now. So when it comes to any malignancy, if you are asked how to manage it, how to treat it, once you have been given the diagnosis, you don't have to go into, you don't have to write or mention about the investigations because diagnosis has been made. So, what you can say is that you can, after staging, uh, you have to decide what sort of treatment you are going to do. When it comes to gastric cancer, surgical treatment for early gastric cancers, you can see here in this slide, early gastric cancer, which is uh, not metastatic, the most appropriate treatment will be surgical treatment. And for very early gastric cancer, endoscopic mucosal resection is uh, now practiced. So you have to have some idea about that. 
not the details but when it comes to uh, more advanced locally advanced gastric cancer uh, subtotal gastrectomy or total gastrectomy is the standard procedure you don't have to know the details of the surgery but just remember the fact that gastrectomy alone is not enough it has to be always associated with a lymphadenectomy which is either level 1 close to the stomach or away from the stomach called D2 lymph nodes. D2 level lymph nodes have to be removed to achieve a better prognosis. And once the stomach is removed, basically remember there will be a drainage procedure which is usually bringing a jejunal loop to the stomach, gastrojejunostomy. So these uh, little fact facts are important because in MCQ sometimes you can be asked. Uh, when it comes to SCQs and long cases, again, a uh, six-year-old man undergoes a gastrectomy for gastric cancer and uh, general questions asked are, uh, what are the inward post-operative care? What is the in inward post-operative care and what are the complications after gastrectomy? Very commonly asked questions uh, if you are discussing epigastric mass or a diagnosed gastric cancer. Most of these things are very general and very standard for any major surgery. So, in inward postoperative care after any kind of major, major surgery includes monitoring like pulse, BP, respiratory rate, urine output, look for bleeding and temperature. Analgesia is a must and if you are asked any kind of postoperative care, uh, just try to remember these things because this is exactly what you are going to do when you become house officers in your post-op round uh, after major laparotomy or gastric surgery or any kind of surgery. These are standard, kneel by mouth and fluid replacement, steam inhalation, chest physiotherapy. Early mobilization is included in ERAS protocol. If you have heard about it, it's good, but otherwise, uh, refinancy ERAS protocol is enhanced recovery after surgery. I'm sure most of you all would have heard about it. Uh, this protocol, you can read about it. Basically, what it does is that you mobilize the patient very fast and uh, feed the patient fast and then you support his systems and then uh, that will enhance the recovery. So the, there should be some basic idea about this ERAS protocol uh, among yourselves. Early mobilization is part of it. And uh, generally, there will be jejunostomy feeding, jejunostomy. Uh, after second day, you can start feeding the patient through the jejunostomy. Because till the anastomosis is healed, uh, you can't, uh, you should avoid oral feeds. Oral feeding generally starts around 7 to 10 days after gastrography study and suture removal if it's an open surgery because nowadays most of it is done, especially in early gastric cancers, it is done laparoscopically, so there won't be any suture removal involved. So try to uh, remember these steps. If you are asked this common question of inward postoperative care, just after major surgery, major abdominal surgery. Specific complications you will look for, the second part after gastrectomy. Uh, actually, this part is common to all surgeries. If the question is asked that what are the complications you are expecting, you have to start by saying and mentioning these because these are common to most of the gastrointestinal surgeries like external bleeding, or sometimes internal bleeding due to suture slipping and uh, leading to hemorrhagic shock. Then anastomotic leakage and intraabdominal sepsis. The patient is complaining of undue abdominal pain, distension, signs of peritonitis. You have to suspect that. And wound complications like wound infection, wound hematomas. This is a common part of the answer. And general complications are post-operative lung complications. This, these things you would have come across during your training program. 
lung complications, post-operative pyrexia, uh, cardiovascular complications such as uh, post-operative myocardial infarction. Uh, then late the DVT and pulmonary embolism. So this list is common for any kind of uh, DVT is not a very early complication. It comes around uh, five to seven days when the pulmonary embolism comes. But this list is important for you to answer any kind of major surgery. Uh, and the specific complications I have put into this uh, table <coughs> and uh, some basic idea about uh, what can happen when you remove major part of the stomach and connect the uh, st uh, stomach stump to the jejunum. These are the specific complications. Small stomach syndrome, uh, which means that patient can't enjoy a full meal, very early satiety. And dumping syndromes, you don't have to know all the details, but at least you should have heard about it. If an examiner asks, have you heard about dumping syndrome, you must say yes. It could be either early or late. What happens is the food bypasses the pylorus, there is no pylorus. It straight away enters the small intestine. So when it uh, enters the small intestine, that uh, stimulates insulin secretion and it causes hypo hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia and then just after meals, uh, you feel faintish due to the hypoglycemia. But later on then when the food travels to the distal intestine, it is partly digested so that the water also is carried with it and then there is food bolus which is not fully digested uh, because stomach digestion is also important when it comes to digestion as you know. So this food bolus carries, attracts a lot of water and that can lead to late dumping syndrome. Again there will be a hypovolemia. Hypovolemia and you feel uh, faint. So early dumping and late dumping due to different reasons the patient feel dizzy. Bilious vomiting, uh, what happens is the, the duodenal stump, duodenal and proximal jejunal stump collects biliary secretions during night and when you get up suddenly it gets uh, emptied into the stomach stump and then you will have this early morning bilious vomiting. Iron deficiency and megaloblastic anemia due to iron and B12 deficiency loss of intrinsic factor and then uh, protein and fat malabsorption due to again partial digestion of food because the lack of gastric enzymes uh, during the initial part of digestion. Management of advanced cases of course uh, you don't have to this is a crowded slide you don't have to remember all these things these are moving into more postgraduate level. Uh, but we have, what you have to know is that if the gastric cancer is disseminated, uh, then of course you have to think of chemotherapy. Uh, and actually, what you have to know is what is useful in palliative care, what treatment modalities are useful in palliative care. So, in, when it comes to gastric cancer, it will be chemotherapy. You don't have to remember uh, those details of the chemotherapy regimes. Uh, but then also to answer the MCQs, you should know that the targeted therapy, as you know, targeted therapy uh, and immunotherapy also becomes a useful part in prolonging life. So just that knowledge is enough, no need to go into all the details. But then after mentioning that is chemotherapy, targeted therapy and immunotherapy in any question regarding an advanced cancer, you have to always men mention about palliative symptomatic control. So that includes pain, nausea and vomiting, uh, control of malignant ascites, jaundice and uh, nutritional state. So when it comes to any advanced metastatic abdominal cancer, this part you have to remember, this is what we are going to do to just keep the patient comfortable. These are the five points.
So uh, the next differential diagnosis of uh, epigastric pain and discomfort with dyspepsia, the, we are trying to discuss uh, chronic pancreatitis. And uh, this MCQ, you can attempt to answer. Regarding etiology of chronic pancreatitis, regular social alcohol intake is a common cause. Um, answer is false because it's social intake. Uh, regular intake is uh, occasional or intermittent intake is not a direct etiological factor for chronic pancreatitis. But acute bout of alcohol injection may be connected to acute pancreatitis. It can precipitate a uh, bout of acute pancreatitis, but it's not a cause of chronic pancreatitis. So it has to be a prolonged periods of alcoholism uh, with 150 cc or more a day. Uh, it could be genetically determined. Answer is true because cystic fibrosis. It is autosomal recessive genetic disorder is associated with chronic pancreatitis, and it can there is a hereditary variety of chronic pancreatitis as well. So it is genetically determined, and then precipitated by congenital anomalies. Answer is again true. Pancreatic division is division is something you have been taught during your embryology days. Because this is a, an abnormality in the pancreatic duct system where the main pancreatic duct is not draining the pancreas but the accessory duct uh, acts as the drainage system and which causes a kind of a prolonged obstruction to the pancreatic drainage leading to chronic pancreatitis. So pancreatic division is uh, one of the reasons that is a congenital anomaly. Metabolic causes include hyperthyroidism and hyperlipidemia. Hyperthyroidism and hyperlipidemia. Answer is obviously false because one little word is missing here. Uh, because it's not hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism has nothing to do with uh, chronic pancreatitis. It should be hyperparathyroidism and hyperlipidemia. So you have to carefully read. The MCQs uh, because when you moment you see hyperlipidemia, you must think that the brain will connect this to hyperparathyroidism. So, uh, but read it carefully. This is not a printing error. This is purposely included here. In South Asia, commonest cause of young adults is alcoholism. Uh, actually speaking, the studies have shown that. Uh, it is in young adults, common cause is the tropical pancreatitis. You have to know a few things about tropical pancreatitis uh, because uh, this is found fairly frequently among uh, South Asians, including our country, and especially the food stuff, various uh, indigenous food like uh, commonly ingested food like uh, cassava, that is. Manioc is uh, blamed for getting this condition. But actually, the later studies have shown that uh, this relationship is not a very strong one and it's a more association rather than a causative factor. So, uh, but if you go through the recent studies, you find that uh, manioc causing chronic pancreatitis is not a, a very direct, there's, there's no direct relationship. So uh, at the exam, if the examiner asks, you can always tell that, that it has been thought to cause chronic pancreatitis, but the new studies have shown that uh, it is an association rather than a direct positive factor. And uh, I have just put a little slide here for you to recapitulate your knowledge in uh, chronic pancreatitis etiology. But remember the drugs generally do not cause chronic pancreatitis, uh, but uh, it is more a reason for acute pancreatitis. Uh, 
little slide on tropical pancreatitis for you to read leisurely uh, to enhance your knowledge. But there are investigations we can do. Uh, how do you confirm chronic pancreatitis? Uh, generally, it's uh, to find the pancreatic uh, strictures. The structural changes and then the pancreatic function. If you ask the question, what are the tests to be done in chronic pancreatitis or pancreatic disease, even this is the answer. Uh, first, to eliminate the structural, uh, to uh, find structural details, you can do ultrasound. But remember, ultrasonography is not a not the best investigation, except when it comes to endoscopic ultrasonography. The abdominal ultrasonography is not a very reliable investigation because the pancreas is retroperitoneal and especially in obese people uh, and uh, people with dilated intestinal groups, uh, pancreas is not very clearly delineated or clearly seen in abdominal ultrasonography. But when it comes to endoscopic ultrasonography, it is quite useful. You can see a little picture here. If you have not seen the uh, real procedure, uh, if time permits, just go into a YouTube uh, video and have a look. And uh, when it comes to, uh, actually speaking, if you are given an MCQ, we will always put this word abdominal ultrasonography. Uh, so that is not the best. Okay. And uh, Computed tomography is the most useful, contrast enhanced tomography, and endoscopic, uh, that is ERCP, again quite useful in finding the structural problems in the pancreatic duct system. Not only pancreatic duct system, even biliary system can be investigated by these means. So these are the specific investigations, and pancreatic function, pancreatic function has to be tested exocrine function and endocrine functions. For the whole answer, uh, this is how you summarize it. Uh, when it comes to treatment, suppose there is a good chance that you might get a chronic pancreatitis case, in long case, with epigastric pain. Ultimately, uh, the clinical features will be very suggestive of chronic pancreatitis and then you will start with this question of how to manage this patient. So the medical management and uh, endoscopic management is, the, is in the front line and uh, basically it's the pain medication. So generally this pain is a prolonged chronic pain so that many of them will need opioid analgesics because uh, according to the WHO pain ladder, uh, the basic basic uh, drugs might not work in chronic pancreatic pain. So these people, there is a high tendency of becoming addicted to drugs, opioids. And then artificial digestive enzymes are needed and insulin replacement. And steroids, if you have immunological a cause of pancreatitis and strict avoidance of alcohol. So you, you have to remember the medical treatment under those five headings. And when it comes to endoscopic treatment, pancreatic duct stones uh, and pancreatic duct narrowing, you can tackle with shockwave orthotripsy if those are stones, just like what we do, the same machine used for renal stones, you can use the shockwave orthotripsy for larger duct stones which are blocking the pancreatic duct. But remember that to use shockwave orthotripsy, the stone has to be seen, preferably seen in X-ray because focusing is done with uh, CR. But if you can't see, a clever ultrasonologist might be able to locate the stone for us to uh, shockwave the pancreatic stone, especially at the uh, distal pancreatic duct. ERCP and make uh, doing a sphincterotomy with removal of stones for treating the strictures is also very standard. 
and sometimes the sticker is very stubborn you can place a stick and indications of surgery uh, i have put this uh, box actually prematurely but anyway uh, the single best answer question we are we have discussed we have discussed is uh, what is not an indication for surgical intervention in chronic pancreatitis the answer is number 4 because the just the presence of uh, duct calculi and pancreatic calcification doesn't mean that patient has to be operated because it's a single best answer i mean if the duct stone is blocking the duct yes you have to do surgery but when you look at the other causes other five causes they are more suitable for surgical intervention these are these will definitely need surgical intervention 1 2 3 and 5 four also will need surgical intervention but not all so when i when you come to a single best answer sba out of these five answers you will find that four is the one which is which falls under the category of not so this is how the single best answers are made so when you have time go through the other indications and especially the pseudocysts are following you know generally they follow an episode of acute pancreatitis Uh, and the management of sclerosis i should you should know uh, when it comes to surgery you should uh, revise your knowledge uh, the basically there is a duct obstruction there are various types of surgeries you don't have to remember these names but it's always nice if you are a person who remembers names it's always nice to remember a couple of names uh, out of that the puesto is the standard where the whole pancreatic duct which is narrow in many places can be open from top to bottom from left to right and then uh, part of the jejunum the jejunal loop can be attached to that to make it to drain so that is called puesto pancreatico jejunostomy and sometimes you can remove only the disease distal pancreas and bring a jejunal loop into the proximal pancreas for it to drain the remaining duct is called phrase operation and then sometimes you can remove a large amount of uh, the pancreas leaving only small uh, bit in the proximal and distal part for the pancreatic function and then fix those two ducts into a jejunal loop. that is called burgers operation burgers operate procedure you, even if you forget the names it's all right just remember pancreatic duct is open and a jejunal loop is fixed to the duct phrase procedure is also more or less similar to puesto and uh, when it come to treatment of complications uh, fatal malabsorption syndrome replacement of enzymes and then diabetes most of them remember half more than half of them will definitely need insulin therapy and pancreatic pseudocysts which are formed as you know behind the stomach in the lesser sac uh, due to the closure of foramen winslow which is the draining part of the draining point of the lesser sac and there is fluid collection there and uh, the treatment will be if those are fairly large you have to drain that cyst into the stomach so that can be done with an open surgery where you open the dual laparotomy and then you open the anterior abdominal wall and the posterior abdominal wall and connect the pseudo cyst which is lying behind the posterior abdominal wall to the stomach for it to drain this is called open cyst gastrostomy gastrostomy cyst gastrostomy this can be also done laparoscopically without doing a laparotomy or the current uh, gi specialist will do it through the endoscope you can put the endoscope and then make a hole in the posterior stomach wall entering the 
pseudocyst which is behind it and then leave a stent there between the stomach and the pseudocyst for it to drain. That is called stenting or you can make a hole there uh, so that it can drain. So you don't have to remember exact details but just remember these are the modalities available if it comes to a kind of a more advanced discussion. Then the other cause the, out of the five differential, five or six differential diagnosis of our topic, the more sinister, another sinister cause is pancreatic cancer. Uh, some details will be discussed when we are discussing obstructive jaundice in future classes. But basically, let us try to answer this true false question. Long standing diabetes could be the cause of the result of pancreatic cancer. The question says that diabetes can cause pancreatic cancer and diabetes can be a result of pancreatic cancer. So, answer is false because uh, actually speaking, uh, long standing diabetes. There is no evidence to show that it uh, it causes pancreatic cancer. But uh, you must remember that a person with chronic pancreatitis can suddenly uh, develop di diabetes mellitus, who has been maintaining his sugars, uh, always think of an association with a newly formed pancreatic cancer. That is a well known thing. So, uh, pancreatic cancer will not cause actual diabetic mellitus, but it can precipitate it in a chronic pancreatic pancreatitis patient. So, uh, answer is false because part of it is false. Alcohol is a direct major risk factor. Uh, answer is false because uh, the connection between alcohol and uh, chronic the pancreatitis, uh, pancreatic cancer is chronic pancreatitis. So, uh, the risk is not a direct risk. It is through the alcohol causing chronic pancreatitis and then leading to uh, pancreatic cancer. So, this is not a direct connection. And uh, I have given an additional fact here the smoking is a again direct risk factor. Uh, Trousseau syndrome. But remember, this is not Trousseau's sign. Trousseau and Trousseau are different. Trousseau syndrome is a pathognomonic sign and found in 10% of patients with pancreatic cancer. Um, Trousseau syndrome, you have to know first of all. Uh, generally, Trousseau syndrome is migrating thrombophlebitis, superficial thrombophlebitis, because uh, this. Uh, veins get inflamed and then clotted and these veins found in Trousseau syndrome are in some odd places like in the chest wall or in the upper arm where general thrombophlebitis is not found. So if you find these th migrating thrombophlebitis then that can precede an intra-abdominal cancer by months. So this may be a sign of very early intra-abdominal cancer so you have to investigate. The answer to this question is wrong uh, because uh, it is not pathognomonic. Pathognomonic means if Trousseau syndrome is there, the disease has to be pancreatic cancer. But it is not so because you find it in many other, some other upper gastrointestinal uh, cancers like gastric cancer. So that uh, it is not pathognomonic. That's why this answer is wrong. You find it that 10 percent part is right, 10 percent of patients, Trousseau syndrome is there in pancreatic cancer, but it is not pathognomonic. Now, that word you have to know. There is urethral bleeding after trauma. It is a pathognomonic sign of urethral injury. That is true. Because if there is urethral bleeding after direct trauma, uh, bleeding means there is some sort of urethral injury. There is no other reason. Like that. So, uh, brain metastases are common in pancreatic cancer. 
answer is true because uh, uh, these are uncommon because generally it follows a pattern in pancreatic cancer, lymph nodes and later into the liver, parietal cavity, uh, lungs and large intestine. So brain metastases are uh, not that common. A biopsy by final aspiration often image guided may be used where there is uncertainty. Sometimes back, bi biopsying a pancreatic cancer was a taboo in the sense it was thought to be dangerous because there can be uh, dissemination. But it, that is uh, proven to be sort of a false, a false alarm. Um, biopsy is important when it specially comes to a uh, non specific or uncertain malignancy in the pancreas. So uh, it is true. But the biopsy can do it two ways. One is CT guided or endoscopic guided, endoscopic ultrasound guided. Out of those, CT guided biopsy has technical difficulties. Uh, and because of that, now much more popular technique is uh, use endoscopic ultrasound, as I mentioned earlier uh, in uh, gastric cancer part. And then the, you can do a guided biopsy which is much safer and uh, more reliable in ex expert hands. And I have put few uh, slides here for you to actually go through uh, to refresh your knowledge regarding investigations and risk factors of pancreatic cancer. When it comes to a discussion or answering questions about treatment, only curative method, curative treatment is surgical management. And uh, if you are fortunate, somebody is fortunate to uh, get the malignancy detected early, then uh, surgical management is offered. And as most of you must be knowing, standard treatment is removal of the pancreas and the adjacent duodenum, uh, including the pinpoint part of the uh, pylorus. And once you do that, there will be three organs which are free without drainage that is the bile duct, the pancreatic stump and the uh, intestine and the stomach. So uh, the piece of intestine that is jejunum as you can see here is brought up there and then all these three ducts, three tubular structures are drained into the jejunum. So that's why it is called the whipple's triple anastomosis or Whipple's uh, procedure with triple anastomosis. There are three anastomotic sites, common diet, stomach and the pancreatic tail. So uh, rarely uh, if you detect a distal pancreatic tumor, you might not have to go on, uh, go through this formidable procedure. As you know, Whipple procedure is a very major procedure and uh, you don't have to uh, go through that and uh, you can get rid of the distal pancreas and then uh, the proximal pancreas can be drained uh, to the to the jejunum. And remember that distal pancreatic, there is an MCQ there somewhere, distal pancreatic tumors are detected late because they are not symptomatic. Remember that fact very clearly because they do not block the uh, common bile duct and the pancreatic duct. Proximal duct, when we are doing jaundice, we will be discussing this again. The proximal tumors, they block the, obstruct the uh, bile duct and cause jaundice. So they are actually detected little early. But distal pancre pancreatic tumors are very silent. So they are, by the time they are symptomatic, they are very advanced. So that gives bad prognosis. Just remember that. And there are minimal invasive techniques where if the tumor is advanced and then the patient cannot undergo any kind of uh, radical surgery to remove it, uh, to relieve jaundice, relieve obstruction to the common duct, and relieve the obstructed uh, pancreatic duct, you can do stenting. 
And reference procedure can be done, can be done either in an open method or nowadays more commonly laparoscopic. Again, when it comes to pancreatic tumor, you have to have some idea what sort of palliative methods are available. No need to understand, try to remember all these uh, details of it. Uh, for uh, regime and, and things like that, uh, unless you are going for the double distinction or something like that. Uh, just know that chemotherapy is the salvage uh, procedure. Uh, chemotherapy with basically 5-fluorouracil and gemcitabine. And radiotherapy may form a treatment uh, to attempt the tumor, sometimes advanced tumors, large tumors, to a resectable size. So if MCQ comes saying that pancreatic tumors are sensitive to radiotherapy, that's true. But if the MCQ says that pancreatic tumors can be treated with radiotherapy as a curative measure, it is wrong. So radiotherapy is used as an adjunctive method called uh, uh, preoperative radiotherapy to that's called downstaging radiotherapy to downstage the tumor so that later on the surgeon can remove it. So radiotherapy, if, if somebody says it's not radiosensitive, that is also wrong. And radiation delivered during surgery, that is called intraoperative radiation, is a standard technique. It has less side effects. So this is actually a special technique of radiation because generally, as you know, radiation is given from outside is called teletherapy or external beam therapy or it is given as little radioactive seeds implanted in the organ called brachytherapy and this is a teletherapy or external beam radiotherapy a special technique of external beam radiotherapy where during surgery you can irradiate the pancreas. Uh, protons are a different energy source used and uh, it is competing with radiotherapy, so it has fewer side effects. So just know that pancreatic tumors are sensitive to chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and radiotherapy is given only as a downstage procedure, and proton therapy is having less side effects. This part has been already covered. Uh, during our dysphagia partly. So uh, basically, this last few minutes, I would like to, uh, this is again, uh, again falls into the differential diagnosis of uh, uh, upper uh, or epigastric or upper GI symptoms. So investigations are basically, we have already discussed under dysphagia, endoscopy, uh, biopsy, especially if it's Barrett's, this is a picture of Barrett's esophagus, you can see there. The gastric co intestinal epithelium here in red color, and the white color is the esophageal epithelium. You can see the nice margin there. And if it is intestinal epithelium, you have it is more dangerous because that is the one which get converted into uh, malignancy more than the gastric epithelium. And this is white one, is always the esophageal, and uh, sometimes you can get this picture in a uh, OSPI station. So get your eyes used to recognize this thing. So uh, esophageal pH uh, monitoring and then barium studies again are not very useful only if you are suspecting a uh, hiatus hernia, rolling type of or sliding type of hiatus hernia, you might order a barium study. And manometry is important again to locate the gastroesophageal junction. And then uh, see whether the gastroesophageal junction, the high pressure zone is still maintained or not. Uh, then uh, because uh, the, depending on that, you will decide whether to subject this patient at uh, one day for surgery. So uh, manometry is important and uh, wireless capsule endoscopy, esophageal pH monitoring is an advanced technique. I don't think you have to worry too much about it, but uh, in specialized center this is being done. Medical treatment for uh, GORD, um, best answer actually, there are six answers, but uh, the best will be out of these. Now all are good, 
all are given for jivadi what is indispensable is the one so the best of five or best answer questions generally all the all the responses are good but you have to select the best so the answer here will be uh, number 3 that is the proton pump inhibitors are a must out of the whole lot whole lot can be used antacids alginates uh, histamine blockers prokinetics antibiotics and lifestyle adjustment just know that in mild cases is taylor regime somebody might ask uh, what is taylor regime or what is the lifestyle adjustment advice you will give to the patient and these are the things called taylor regime avoid tight belts fatty spicy food weight reduction avoid alcohol etc right so and if there's no response to uh, the medical management refractory medical management uh, you have to have a basic idea about what are the surgical uh, options generally what is nowadays done the most popular method is fundoplication so we have to have some basic knowledge about it basically what it does is that this fundus is mobilized fundus is mobilized um, sorry about this uh, fundus is mobilized and brought behind the esophagus and uh, you wrap it around wrap around the esophagus by the 100 360 degrees a total wrap which is called nissen spinal fundoplication is the most commonly done one or you can bring it only 280 degrees halfway through like this or to pay or you can bring it in front you can bring it in front and attach to the esophagus so it will act as a cushion to increase the esophageal pressure and this is called fundoplication you can do it as a openly or laparoscopically the lapros laparoscopic method is becoming very popular now so most of the cases are done by the experts uh, by laparoscopy so just know the principles of it and uh, the latest methods you just know that these things are existing in this world that is transoral incisional spondylization where rather than opening or uh, doing laparoscopically mobilizing uh, these structures and suturing instead of that you can use only the endoscope a special endoscope with stapling of fundus into the esophagus the way this uh, picture depicts so it's a very specialized incisionless see incision without incision a transoral technique incisionless technique of doing the same thing uh, with a endoscope alone. so if you just look at this picture it is very self explanatory the stapling stapling technique and gold stones again falls under the differential diagnosis of dyspepsia and epigastric pain but those are low down in the priority list and mesenteric angina which is a late epigastric pain which will be discussed later on uh, in this uh, revision series so thank you very much uh, uh, for going, uh, being with us and then uh, i hope that uh, you will combine the two parts of this lecture and by weaving it again and again uh, you will find it very easy to tackle a patient with epigastric pain and dyspepsia uh, thank you very much